Hi friends, welcome to Law Chat with Gerja. I'm Gerja Bhargav Patel, your host for Law Chat, and I am so excited for you to join us today. I have some amazing guests on Law Chat, and they're here to share their experiences and entrepreneurial journey with us, and through their storytelling, mentorship with us, because that is the whole point. We are all entrepreneurs and we're all on a journey and learning from one another is the best way for us to move forward in our journey as well. And I have amazing guests who are so willing and ready to share their stories with us, their challenges and their victories and their achievements and also their mindset. I just can't wait to share that with you. And I also just can't wait to have that conversation with them. It's such a privilege to have each and every one of them here with us today. And also it's such a privilege to have you listening in and tuning in. So let's dive in to Law Chat with Gerja. Hi friends, welcome to Law Chat. I believe charity should be a part of anyone's business plan. It should just be part of the systems that you're having. And today our guest, her life's journey inspired her to start her philanthropic business, her non-for-profit Do Good Ministries, a non-profit globally empowering at-risk teens, including teen moms and foster youth through life skill awareness, education, vocational training, and biblical discipleship. She's published a book, Purposely Woven, and she's also published, I think, another book, right? You've, you've had two books now under your belt. Mm-hmm. I love that. And I am just so happy to have Kelly Pandolfi with us today. Welcome to Law Chat, Kelly. I am Thank so you. excited to have you here today because we have not had anybody that has spoken about um, nonprofits. And it's so important because there's so many out there. And I know so many people want to start one as well even if it's alongside their business. So I'm really excited to have these conversations with you and some guidance on how to do that, but then also about Mm -hmm. your journey. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Gerja. I appreciate it. Thank you. So tell me, how how did you get into this charity space? So let's see. It's, it's, I know that that question's interesting because it's kind of been a lifestyle for me. So I have to try to, okay, when people ask that question, pinpoint where, where and how did it start? Um, I would say that being a woman of Christian faith, I really had some time about six years ago praying longer than that. But I would say the pivotal point was about six years ago of just asking God to break my heart for what breaks his. That was really the conversation I was having. And as I asked that question, um, I was already in at-risk teen ministry, um, but he really just said, this is what breaks my heart. You know, there's just a demographic out there that is misunderstood and not seen and not heard and maybe categorized and labeled wrongly. And um, they need help. They need a voice. So that is kind of where in a, in a nutshell (laughs) of where that came from. Um, I I was, you know, like I said, it was a lifestyle before that, but that's really where that pivotal, I think, turn that point was for me. Mm, I just want to talk about that for like a split second, but I, I love that's where you started. You know, lifestyle is, That's also such an abundant lifestyle to be living in a terrible mindset where you are giving and that's your purpose of service. But what's also so beautiful is that your journey began with prayer. Your journey began with intention and with kind of having that spiritual element to it where it's almost like God is your partner and kind Mm -hmm. of like joining you on this journey. So then where did that take you from there? Um, so I was, I I will say that I agree with you completely. So I, I have a little blog that no one reads, but it's there (laughs) and it's called purposeful life. And, um, you will all, and they might read it now (laughs) (laughs) and it's attached to my, um, website. There's a space there to read the blog. And then my books are purposely woven and purposely rooted. So you can kind of see there's a, there's a pattern there. So I was going to just kind of back you up on that. I agree with you completely. I think that there is a, there's a purpose to everything and there's a purpose to our being and we're all created to be created beings and to serve something bigger than ourselves. So what does that look like for each of us? We're all participating in doing that, Mm -hmm. but we might not even know we're doing that in a sense, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I, I just wanted to back you up on that and say, I agree with you on that. It's, it's, uh, and it's a beautiful thing to, know 
what your gift is and what your purpose is and to be actively doing that. So the question you asked me was, sorry. (laughs) I love that. I think it's so nice though, because a lot of times we have something tugging at our heart and we Mm -hmm. just don't listen to it because we think that, no, I studied this. So therefore I should do this. I thought I was made for this. So therefore I should do this. And while Mm -hmm. you may not have to forego that, but at the same right. time, you might, and you kind of need to follow that. And so I know you started this, um, this ministry to help at-risk youth, but how was that when you first started it? Like, what did you do? You're like, okay, I need to do this. But then what was your next step after you did that? Yeah, so um, really, so really what the timeline was, was I was already working, um, I've been in ministry for over two decades, volunteering, I had worked in um, a local pregnancy center um, in another state, and um, did some counseling and fundraising and marketing there. And so I was already, I, I, I could already see, I look back now, and this is an interesting point as well. <clears throat> I look back now, and I can see, you know, 10 years ago, how God had orchestrated my steps and put me in line with people and places and jobs and things and volunteering and Mm -hmm. service to get me to that Mm -hmm. point of opening that nonprofit. So um, community is super, super important. And that's something that I want to capitalize on is how important it is to pay attention to who's being placed in front of you and who you're being placed in front of as well. That's very important. And sometimes I would see it and sometimes I didn't till later, but I can look back now and I'm just in awe of who I've been placed in front of and who's been placed in front of me for me to help their journey and for them to help mine. And just that community is very important. So I really can look back about 10 years and I'm sure I haven't even looked further than that and I can see it, but seeing how volunteer opportunities, just opportunities to be, uh, had a little part-time job that I just thought was me helping, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and just learning marketing skills that I needed to do um, social media marketing, because I am, you know, I do it all. I'm a very small nonprofit. So Mm -hmm. right now I'm not in the, don't have the capacity to hire out. So it's just amazing to see how all those things have been put in place. And I'm just, and, and I think it's important to, be where you're at and be there fully. And sometimes we want to say, I want to start this nonprofit. And that's one thing is when I do mentor people about nonprofits, I didn't want this. It wanted me, if that makes sense. Like I didn't set out to say, I'm going to start a nonprofit. God said, you're going to start a nonprofit. And I said, oh, that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And we kind of had this. Yeah, really. And then I kind of had this uh, conversation back and forth for about six to eight months with, I don't have the skills, I'm not equipped. Um, and we just had a dialogue. And so I, I would say to you that not all the time, I'm not saying that when you want to start something, it shouldn't be your idea. But a lot of the times, a lot of the people that I've met have the same story of mine as it was kind of picked them and, 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 and was something that they didn't feel um, equipped, or, but they are relying on not just their own strength. Um, it was, it's a very humbling experience. So mm-hmm. just saying, having that conversation and, and not going ahead, it was very important for me. Um, I, I've had a lot of hard things happen in my life that has also helped me in my serving in my ministry to be able to emotionally uh, come alongside someone and um, just sympathize with them. So that's another thing that's helped me. Um, So my first book, Purposely Woven, Turn Tragedy and Trial into Triumphs, is pretty much about that, you know, just how the trials and um, the tragedies in our life can actually be our greatest gifts if we look at it that way. And that sounds harsh sometimes, and some people aren't ready to hear that, but there's a lot of truth to that. So you will also see that for me, like starting a nonprofit was, there was things that had been happening to me from my childhood that led me to this point to say, let's use what has been broken in you and let's use what's been hard in your life to help other people. And I think we, we can kind of see that in the nonprofit world is um, most of the time and it works and it works well, it's because people are using their pain for purpose. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. You're right. That's truly beautiful. I love how you said, you know, turning your tragedy and the challenges into something that works for you. And it's like victorious. You're coming out of it, right. not in a negative space, but you're coming out of it in a positive space. And it's mm-hmm. hard and not, and it can't be, people aren't always ready to see it or hear it. 
And eventually, hopefully with time, it's a journey. And with time, Mm -hmm. there's a lot of healing that comes with it too. Actually, I also think you're, you know, you're touching on the fact that paying attention to who's in front of you, who you go in front of and who comes in front of you is so important because every aspect of the journey, I think is interwoven also. And it is getting you ready for the next step. It's getting you ready for the next chapter in your journey and where you're supposed to go. And a lot of times it's easy to kind of default on the negative and be like, oh, well, that's terrible. And so when you were starting your nonprofit at, the, at that time, were you the person that actually did the filings for it, like all the registrations and all that stuff? So how did, what, what is that? What does that look like? How does that, what, what is all the work that that entails? Yeah. So really what it looks like, and, and I'm, I have the personality of I'm a person that needs to learn myself good or bad, this could be a good and a bad thing. Um, I like to research and find it myself because I'm one of, okay, like I'm one of those people that says when somebody goes, oh, look at this on my phone and they want to hold the phone in front of me and they want to read it to me. I'm all, can I read that? Yes. Like, I'm that annoying person that tries to take your phone because I want to read it. I don't know if that makes, yeah. So that's I know me. what you're saying. And yeah. so I, yeah. So I have to, I'm like, I have to read the words. I don't want you to read it to me. So it's that, you know, visual learner, not audio learner thing. Mm-hmm. And, um, and so that's how I am. So I'm like getting on, digging in, trying to find. Um, so basically it just, it started Google searching, like, you know, how to start a nonprofit because I've, I've started a nonprofit in the other state that I lived in, in a different state. And um, that was for a youth sporting, a sporting event thing. So um, a, a sport. So that was a totally different. That was for when um, my, my children that are now older were younger, they're adults now. And it was for an event for them, um, Mm -hmm. a sport. So I did that and I've done nonprofit that way. And um, every state, so I will say every state has totally different requirements, a different filing system, all of that. So every state is different. And so I had to learn coming to another state how to do that. And I will say this state was easier. So I was, and you're in Texas. I'm in Texas. Yes. And the the state I had filed in before for it did a nonprofit was California. So California was a lot more difficult. Um, a lot. It, I didn't have it as bad as some other people did because I heard horror. And that's the other thing. Um, I think it's very important to, it's great to, and hopefully I can be, you know, help with any mentorship, you know, hopefully this is helpful to those who are listening, but it's great to tell people about, but be cautious about, I I would say, if you're of faith, pray about it before you go out and just tell the masses. Um, If you're not of faith, really, if it's whatever it is you need to do, really put some thought into like surrounding yourself and make sure you're, protect that vision and that dream because we live in a society where, um, you know, hurt people hurt people. So there's a lot of people out there that want to go the minute you say, oh, I want to start a nonprofit and you're so excited. There's nothing worse than going to a person and saying that. And then that person going, um, oh my gosh, well, I, there's no, I heard that that's a nightmare and you can, in which I have kept some of that come my way. I heard that's a nightmare. That's too hard. How are you going to do that with kids at home? You know, whatever it is that people want to say. So there's two folds on this. Let's as people be very careful how we use our speech because it can be very either life giving or life damaging to people. And then the other thing is, you know, just really being really being wise about who you I think share that with, and protect that. You know, protect that dream that you have, or or if, if it you know if it's something you really feel that you want to do. There's no limits. We put so many limits on ourselves now, and we we. Right. We don't have to speaking negatively to ourselves comes easy. Right. The negativity is um, I mean, and I did it. It was I'm not equipped. I can't do this. I don't have that comes easy. It's we have to train ourselves to speak life over ourselves, life giving words. That's the hard part. The easy part is immediately the negative thoughts that come in and replacing those with positive. So I think that's important is to um, be careful who you really before you go out and you are really vocal about it. 
really be wise about who you share that with. And if you've got two or three people that are really life giving to you and you know, that will support you, if it's, it doesn't have to be monetarily, it doesn't have to be that they're right in the mix with you, but just asking you, Hey, how's that going this week? You know, you said you were working on get, you know, contacting the the state and how that work. And you know, that that's really important too. So yeah. So just digging in and um, really just searching myself. That's how I do things. I asked around, I really would, um, you know, I, I, I've been very blessed in my life to, you know, when I pray for God to surround me with people that have wisdom and that I would need to help instill in me that happens. So, um, I did have a couple of people that I would just like, you know, just randomly meet through a friend and then they'd be like, Oh, you know, they did this. And, and so I didn't talk to very many people and get very many mentoring advice, but it was more me really researching myself. And I really suggest that because then you take more ownership of it and you really, you're learning as you're going, which some people were so scared to take that courage to step out to do something. You know, fear comes from unknown. Fear is because anytime I'm fearful of something or I act out of fear or I react out of fear is because it's unknown to me, right? So we are, as a society from a very young age, teach our children almost not to fail, and not to Mm -hmm. fear. And that's actually really not good for us as individuals, really stepping out in fear and and stepping out and failing is a way to grow, but Mm -hmm. we just don't, we don't do that. So really I would say it's okay to fail. It's okay to research it for yourself. And if you do the paperwork wrong, if something happens, that's how you learn. So I really just, you know, dug in and started and, and each link brought me to another link and taking good notes and writing it down. And that's kind of how I got started. That's awesome. You just, packed that with so much wisdom. Just that one answer is packed with wisdom. And I'm going to actually do the bullet points on it because I, I think it's so true that we need to be protective of our dreams. And it's not where you don't share it, but you share it with the right audience. You share it with the yeah. person that is receiving it in a way where they're not trying to smash it and destroy it. Right. Dreamer. I'm a dreamer. I'm a dreamer. And I'm like this forever optimist, like hopeless optimist out there also. (laughs) And so I truly believe that anything is possible. It's, and there's, there's magic in faith and it's like, you can, you can do a lot. And so I, I think it's so true that we need to be protective of our dreams. We need to be the people that also speak blessings over other people and speak positivity over other people. And we also need to show grit in our own business and like really get into the trenches, especially when, you know, when you are starting a new business and it's really good to actually get exposure to the areas that feel scary or the areas that feel overwhelming because that's the only way you learn. Getting guidance is not a bad thing. Outsourcing things that are just out of your realm of control or realm of, uh, expertise also might be a good idea, but ask the, ask ask those people for help. Ask them for guidance also while they're doing the work for you. I love when my clients ask me all the questions because I know that they are involved in their business and I know that they are going to walk away after my help with so much confidence in what's happening and also to be better able to communicate what they're doing in their business as well. And so that is so important. I hate to interrupt this awesome conversation, but I have to stop and talk with you about the number one thing I'm asked about by entrepreneurs, contracts. They're vital to any business relationship and to protect your business. But I also know that entrepreneurs, especially when you're starting up, money is tight, but I would never want you to compromise on a strong legal foundation. So enter your contractbuddy.com, a website created by me with contract templates created and drafted by me and fellow industry partners. They're ready to use and easy to plug in immediately. And they are not restricted to any specific state. So yourcontractbuddy.com is sponsoring this episode and you and your listener can get 10% off right now with code LAWCHAT. Yes, you heard me right. 10% off right now with code LAWCHAT. And now back to our awesome conversation. And I love how you also pray that, you know, surround me with the right people, surround me with the people that can give me that wisdom, that can give me the tools of resources. And I think it's, there's so much power to prayer. And I'm just so happy you're here with me today because I don't think we talk about that enough. Mm. I'm very spiritual. I totally believe in God. And I think like 
prayer is your number one tool in your toolkit. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's mine. I mean, I don't, I, you know, that's what's that's you'll hear me refer to it a lot. So it might yeah. get annoying to some people, but that's where, that's my journey. It's a, it's a huge part of my journey. Um, for myself and I really don't make any decisions. So that's why when a lot of people will say, Oh, you know, give me a timeline or give me this. There's the, the timeline is, is that I wrestled with God for a while on it because I didn't want to do it. I had all the reasons why not. And he gently, like he always does just sat there and waited for me to come around and really, you know, answered all those questions I had with the dialogue going back and forth. Okay. Yeah. But see, this is where I can't do it and this and, and this is, and you know, and it was just, you know, dig in and find out. And so I started and I had all these checklists of reasons why it wouldn't work out. And then he would smash every single one of those and open a door and, you know, and, and it's just, and you can't dispute that, you know, so. No, no, you can't. And the way you overcame the negative mindsets or the things that limited your own thoughts of your capabilities, that was through your faith that you overcame that. That was through prayer. And so normally I ask all my guests, what is your anchor? And so if I ask you that, like when you face challenges and when you face setbacks, what is your anchor? My anchor is my faith. I am not here to live for myself. I'm here for a greater purpose than that. And so, Mm -hmm. and I think so many of us are walking around and I remember being that person of living for satisfying my own desires. And we live in a self-help, self-care society that really pushes that right now. And there's nothing wrong with self-care and there's nothing wrong with doing things yourself. But yeah, I just, the light bulb goes on the light bulb really clicks once Mm -hmm. you kind of take that turn in your life and go, wow, life's so much bigger than me. And Mm -hmm. just, and and I'm, and I'm a great part of that. And I'm a great part of this great story of humanity, but, and, and, and each of us has a special, beautiful role to play, but are we doing it within our purpose? Mm -hmm. Are we Mm -hmm. living it within our purpose? So for me, it's, really having that light bulb go off and go, you know, just God, use me, use me, you know, you've, you've gifted me, you've created me. What does that look like? And gosh, if we lived in a world where we, as, as people would do that, how beautiful it would be. Mm -hmm. Okay. I want to actually ask you two questions from here. My mind is like thinking, oh, well, should I ask her, how do we know our purpose or how do we know? Mm -hmm. Cause I I think there's many purposes, not just one, Mm -hmm. Yeah, but then Also, my question, I want to be like, I want to reel myself back in and be like, okay, let's talk about the nonprofit, (laughs) but I think we can talk about both. So I want to, I really want to ask you before we jump back to the nonprofit journey in the sense of the steps and the processes that kind of go into starting a nonprofit, but I really want to talk about the purpose. How are some ways to know this is my purpose Mm -hmm. or this is the direction I should be going in? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, um, there's actually interesting, I've written a couple articles on this on purpose. So a couple things, so we can, I'll just give you the short version. Um, so there you're, I mean, I don't think there's a checklist end all just, this is what I have found for me and my, and my personal journey and readings that I've done and, and ways that I've dug into it. We already talked about how your purpose is your passion, right? Mm-hmm. And that word passion can be misguided and thrown around a lot, I think, because people think you need to just love it and be on fire for it. Not all the time are you going to feel that way about something that's passionate about you. I mean, I um, have had things in my life, like but what's brought me to my purpose has been a lot of pain. It's been a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. And so it didn't seem like that was my purpose when I was grieving and going through pain and going through loss and going through hard things. But it's, I think there's two different types of people in the world and there's, you're going to either push through, through the pain and find your purpose at the end of that. And that pain is going to become your passion or you're going to sit and lament and just stay in that pain and not grow from it. And I just think there's the two, it's really, you are, you aren't. And so we see a lot of people walking around living, sitting in pain that just don't have the tools or the capacity yet to move past that. And they might never. Um, And then we see people that have, we've all had pain, right? We, We all have either had it or we're going to have it. 
or you push through it. And that push through it is your journey. And that I believe is what is becomes your purpose. Really, I do. I, I have spent a lot of time with a lot of people in nonprofits and um, spent a lot of time studying um, ph philanthropy and why people do what they do and, and, and watching. And I'm friends with a lot of people that do different things. And every story that I know is because that purpose, that person starts that nonprofit or they, when they're successful and living in, and, and successful does not mean numbers or how big, or big it is or how much money it's bringing in. That's not success. That's not success. Success is, are you setting out to do what your mission statement was? Mm -hmm. So whatever your mission statement is for your nonprofit, um, I wish we can get away from the numbers game and not worry so much. It needs to be authentic and organic and not be worrying about how that money is going to come in. You just serve in that mission statement and who he's asked you to serve and what that, what your, you, what your mission statement is. That's where when you're living embedded in that, that's success. That's a successful mm. nonprofit. So purpose has, you know, a passion. Purpose has a people. So your purpose is always beyond you. It's always going to have a people. Who are you serving and why are you serving those people? And those people kind of goes back to what we were talking about before. They're put in front of you for a reason. And so um, your purpose has a people. Your purpose has a passion. It has pain. And we've already kind of talked about that purpose as a pain. Um, I'm trying to go through, there's like five or six P's that I had written down and it's in a journal of mine where I had gone kind of through, like somebody's asking me this question. I'm trying to remember what the other ones are, but so your, your purpose, we kind of talked about that. It's going to have a pain point of, of what did you go through? And it's normally always something that you've already gone through. Mm -hmm. And another thing is a lot of people think you have to have arrived. Okay. Kelly hasn't arrived. Kelly's still a human being that fails, that um, is working through, is grieving through things. So don't ever think that's another thing. And I, I kind of had that mindset for a little bit too. Of, well, mm -hmm. I have to be at a certain point before I can, you know, get there. And um, that's not true. Mm -hmm. So I would say really taking your time and, and not rushing it. I think we can smell um, unauthentic a mile away. Most of us can when something's not authentic and um, we live in a society and a world that has everything visually at our, I mean, we are just being visually assaulted all day long with stuff at our face. And so there are so many nonprofits out there that I, for one, am one of those people where I can just, I'm like, Ooh, something doesn't sit right there. That just mm -hmm. doesn't seem real or authentic to me. So that's the other thing is be authentic, be you, don't rush it. You know, it's sit with it for a while, you know, really have a mission statement for yourself that means to you. It has meaning to you. It doesn't matter how eloquent the words are, or how good it sounds, you know, really work on that for yourself mm -hmm. and what you feel you're bringing into the world. You know, mm -hmm. our, our, our purpose is beyond ourselves, we are created to be creative beings. If that means that my purpose is to be home with two children and I'm, and that is my purpose and that's the season I'm in and that season lasts 18 years or two years, that's where you're at. That's your purpose at the time. And, mm -hmm. and being content with that. I think so many times we want to look beyond and see where somebody else is and go, well, I, and I remember when I was at home with my little kids, I knew I was going to be in the mission field. I, God had burned that in my heart. It was something I knew. And that's what I'm doing now. But we're talking 24 years later, mm -hmm. you know, and I can see now, like I said, how every step. And I, I remember when my kids were probably about eight and six and four I, and I talk about this, I actually did a, a talk at a women's event about this. It's, I call it my folding my laundry episode, but, and I won't go all into it, but I basically had a moment where I was folding laundry and I was just, I hated folding laundry. I didn't want to, I wanted to be God, why aren't, don't you have me out here? This is where, you know, you can use me. And he just knocked me flat on my back and was like, this is your mission field. There's three children here. This is your mission field. And for mm -hmm. me, that was my purpose for years and a long time. And then life events happened to where I, that I, I, I changed like that, you know, I went through a divorce and that was not something that I wanted. That was not something that I was hoping for. It was not my dream. And so things had to shift for me and I had to learn to shift with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yes. I, I agree with everything you just said. <laughs> and I also like how you said that the mission can shift. 
And your one mission at that time was to be the mom that you needed to be and the best mom that you can be at the time that you were there, like wholeheartedly, 100% present. Mm -hmm. And then seasons changed, your mission changed. And just being aware of that and having the awareness to be able to make that shift and the agility to make that shift also. I know you were talking about the mission statement earlier. So I'm going to kind of take us Mm -hmm. back into um, starting a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And aside from, you know, now finding the fact that this is your purpose and this is the direction we need to go in and figuring out how to file that 501c and registering it with the state of Texas or whatever state you're in. Right, right. um, Then... I think you're right. Like we need to have just like a business requires a business plan, even a non-for-profit requires some sort of a plan. And yes. hopefully it's some like a business plan itself, but a mission statement is definitely a part of that business plan. So what are some of the things that you had to do in order to get funding? I'm assuming you were also looking for funding. You were also looking for contributors and people that were right, going to support right. this cause. So how did that, what did that look um, like then? Yeah. So um, what that looked like was a bunch of uncomfortableness. (laughs) Asking for (laughs) money is not fun. (laughs) So um, it was, it was super uncomfortable. It's, it's a very refining process as a human to really step out and say, I believe in this. I want you to believe in this. And what does that look like? Because that's what a nonprofit is. It's really what you're doing is this is Mm -hmm. important to me. And I believe in this, but oh my goodness, we could get on the internet right now. There's a gazillion. I mean, you could look up at risk youth and in my category, there's so many, so many choices out there. So a couple things for me personally, I mean, what it looks like is really for me, it was praying through that mission statement. God, give mm-hmm. me the words. What does this look like? What do you break my heart for? What break yours? I already knew the demographic of people he wanted me to serve. What does that look like? And you know what? Here's the thing is that that changes too. In the sense of, for me, I'm constantly, and I take him actually taking a sabbatical in July. Um, and this is my first one in four years. Um, and I, it's, I, and I think it's something I need to do every year. So it's very important. We cannot pour from an empty cup. We just can't. And so, um, when we're not being filled up, then we cannot pour out and, and we're just empty. So I got to the point in this last two years with just the pandemic and, and with the demographics I serve, they're already, I mean, it's kind of like asking somebody to learn how to swim So I'm trying to put this in a sense of like, when I'm, when we're asking like my teen moms and my, and my foster youth that are aging out, like, um, you need to get a job, you need to, you know, you need to be mentally well, you need to know how to parent your children, you know, okay, all those are great. And yes, all those are things that they need, but them just getting up. And I mean, some of them are living in car, have lived in cars or living in cars or Mm -hmm. living in homes where they're being abused or their children are being abused. So it's kind of like telling a, a, a child, okay, go learn to swim. And then you put a huge weighted vest on them and then just, and they're constantly, it's just like this demographic is constantly drowning Mm -hmm. and just to operate in normal life. So for me, I have to shift with that is I have to learn things. I can't just, we cannot just start a nonprofit and expect okay, this is the way it's going to be. And especially if you're just type A personality, you know, this is the bullet points. This is what it's going to look like. Because when you start that paperwork, that's what, that's the part I hated was because I didn't want it. I didn't like that part. I wanted, I like the people part. I like the serving part. I like, I don't like the part where I have to do paperwork and I have to do my taxes and I have to keep receipts. And I I don't like that part. That's not the fun part. Now there's some personalities when they start nonprofits, that's the part they like. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to remember if you're serving people in your nonprofit, be very careful about that because, you don't want to make the system and the rules and the paperwork and the governing to be before the people. You have to do both, but it should be about who we're serving. Mm-hmm. And that's going to shift because that, that changes and things in society change. I mean, I can remember when I started, you know, serving teen moms, you know, in a different, same demographic, but different state, different, you know, little area. Uh, now moving here, it, it's different in the area I live. So if your nonprofit moves at all, even from county to county, you need to move along with it and know, okay, well, this is what our board decided. And these were the rules, but let's reevaluate. 
you know, those let's, it might be time to reevaluate. So being fluid with it is important. Right. Yes. That's really great advice. I think um, it's just the same thing with, you know, situations change and then the focus and the surroundings change also. So do you have a board in your business? Yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, I have a board of a couple and it's, and that's what I do. So yeah, and you do need to have, so that's important when you go and you, and you find all that out. I mean, that part really was the easiest for me was because it's all laid out for you. You go and you click on a link and the state that you're in, how do I start a nonprofit in the state of whatever you, you Google that you start clicking on links. And once you get on that state site, it literally walks you through step-by-step step that process. That part's not hard. Mm -hmm. Um, and it'll ask you to set up, like every state's different, but, um, and, and if it's your, it's just different. Yeah. And did you do it? You did it through the Secretary of State's website, right? The like Secretary the, of State. Yeah. Like the yes. Texas Secretary of State. So yes. if, if somebody goes there, they'd be able to find all the requirements of a nonprofit, like all the Absolutely. things that are required. And all, like I said, all you have to do is starting a nonprofit in the state of Texas, the state of whatever, and it's literally going to pop up and, and you'll just mm -hmm. start clicking on it. It'll bring you to the exact site and then it'll pop up on. And that's all I did. Um, mm -hmm. I, I started walking through those steps and had a couple questions along the way. Actually, I will say the state of Texas is super friendly and I had actually phone numbers I could call and I was shocked when <laughs> I actually dialed the number and I had a lady's voice on the other end and she walked me through some of my questions. So be encouraged if you're in the state of Texas. Unfortunately, California, I, it was very difficult. I never yeah. got to talk to anybody, but I was very, very blown away by how easy it was here. Yeah. I actually, at the Secretary of State's office in Austin, they're very, um, they answer the phone and they actually sit and talk to you. I've, I'm I've called them so many times myself. I'm like, so <laughs> dot, dot, dot. So yeah, they're actually very attentive and they will respond mm -hmm. or they'll give you a number to call another number yeah. that they, that they yeah. believe would be a better, you know, answer. And so if you were to like, if there was somebody right now, somebody in the audience or somebody listening is thinking, okay, I need to start a nonprofit tomorrow. What are some of like the top five things that they need to get going on? I would say number one prayer and or meditation, really, really taking some time thinking through what is the reason and really have get a, get a notebook out. And mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a, I'm one of those people that I gotta, I gotta write, I gotta read it. So I'm um, really taking that time to saying, you know, what are the pros and cons to this? Why mm -hmm. do I want to do this? Who is my demographic? Why am I serving? And starting that conversation on paper. So you can really, there's a, there's a difference between having it in here mm -hmm. and really having it written out where you can see it because sometimes you can go, Oh crap, there's no way I can do this. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, it's just not time. You might look at it and go, this isn't time, but this is a great, like, for instance, I have a business that I am really actively getting going, starting to kind of come off of this nonprofit to actually serve the nonprofit. And it's something I've had in my head for a good five years. And so like, I'm doing that now. I have had a notebook for like five years of this business plan and it just hasn't been time yet, but it's time now. So it's like, now I'm getting that notebook back out and there's just things I've written in there of, you know, everything that you can think mm -hmm. of and don't think it's a waste of time because it might not be the season now, but, you know, start that process of, you mm -hmm. know, what is, what is my goal here? Who am I serving? And I know people don't like that because they really want to get into, well, I just want to start the paperwork and I want to get this going. <laughs> really, that's a waste of your time until you've really digested and sat with your why. Your mm -hmm. why is very, very important, especially when you're serving people. You know, people are people. We're human beings. We have mm -hmm. feelings. We have you don't just assume, and I have to learn that all the time. There's things that I go, oh, I could have done that better. Or I could have mm -hmm. communicated that. You know, I have to con continually be learning my demographic of people I'm serving. So it's not just about starting this nonprofit. I've checked up everything off the list and I'm done. And this is my pretty nonprofit. It's work. It's be there's so much behind the scenes work, at least for me, that's important to me mm -hmm. to be serving who I'm called to serve well. So that means I need to know who I'm serving. So knowing mm -hmm. your why, knowing your who, having all that kind of written down, starting that. And then once you feel, okay, I'm ready to go 
getting on, either surrounding yourself with people. Um, I would say write down those three names. I don't think you really need more than three. Write down those three names of people that are going to support your vision and your dream. And you'll be amazed at probably the outreach that they have to help you. Um, And then getting on, starting that Google search. I recommend you do it yourself. I really do at the beginning. And then you know, getting the lawyers, getting the insurance, getting those things that you need later, but really starting the process yourself. So you are invested. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. I love that steps. And then such practical steps, because truly it is, it is a lot of it is the pre work that you need to do and the filings Mm -hmm. and all just kind of fall into place. Once you start doing them, it's really like how you said, it's just one click after another, after another. And so Talking a little bit about your ministries and then also the books that you have published, who is the person that would be coming to you? And if people needed to send somebody over or refer somebody to you, how would that happen? To serve, to serve the people. Well, if somebody, sponsor, if like, somebody wanted to volunteer actually in your oh, okay. ministry okay. Or, or they wanted to be a part of what you're doing or contribute, mm-hmm. whatever you know, support you. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so it's many things. Um, interestingly enough, I am solely supported by families, by individuals and families. I don't have, people are shocked to hear that I do not have church support, but I don't, I don't even have, and it's very odd to be in the mission field and to have a nonprofit and to not have at least one business or church support Mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't, and do I pray for that? Do I want a a business or two to come beside me and a church to come beside me? I do. But I also protect, um, be, and I'm not saying I'm I'm telling people, no, I'm saying I really pray through, you know, Lord, bring to this. I really, you, you need, there's like, we talked about, there's so many things to give to. And I tell people all the time, the money is not an issue for me. If, if this was to all fade away tomorrow and this nonprofit go away, this nonprofit is not my identity. Mm -hmm. is I am a service to the nonprofit. It's not who I am. It's not my identity. And I think that's a really good, important point is really think of if this wasn't encompassing my world, would I crumble? Would Mm -hmm. I not, would I not be Kelly anymore? Would I not Mm -hmm. be Gears anymore? Would I, would I not be? And if your answer is it would, it's your identity, you need to reevaluate because Mm -hmm. that shouldn't be our identity. It should be, we're a servant to it and, and it's, it's, and we're giving to that, but it's a, if that was because, you know, tomorrow is never promised, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing and things can happen and people can ruin a nonprofit. You can have mm-hmm. a bad and, you know, a bad volunteer and employee come in and things could go all yeah. wrong. And so it's, it's really important to, to protect that. So I, from day one have said when I would go and I would literally, I had a slideshow, I would go into people's homes and I would sit with them over dinner and I would show the husband and the wife or the single person, whoever it was their home. And I would really just make appointments and go and say, this is what I'm doing. And I, I would say nine times out of 10, every person that is on my support team has been there since the beginning. I've only had a couple people drop off. I've had a couple people join, um, but they've all said it's because I believe in the heart of what you're doing. And we firmly believe in that. And that's why we give. And I think that's very, and there's a couple good books I can also give you links to later to yeah. put up if you want that I have read. Um, I've read two really good books at the beginning of, um, and one of them is called When Helping Hurts. So that's specifically for like mission oriented, mm-hmm. you know, fields. That's an excellent book. And I'm trying to remember the name. It was so long ago. I'm trying to remember the name of the other one. It was an older book that I don't even know. You might have a hard time getting it, but I, you might be able to get on Amazon. I'll find the name of that one, but it was about asking, like, it might even be called like the ask. It's Mm -hmm. about asking for giving. And it was an excellent, and actually it was a mentor of mine from a sister ministry gave me that and really walked me. It was like, this was a great book that I read. So then she passed along to me and I read it and um, it's a great book. And, and, really also approaching it to where the asking part for funding is a gift. Like that's something I learned through reading that book, that it's, it shouldn't be embarrassing. It shouldn't feel like you're a burden. It should, it's actually a gift to invite other people to walk alongside you in that community we were talking mm-hmm. about before to walk alongside you and say, I believe in this and I want to give, and I want people to know, like for me and my ministry, I hope my supporters know, and I try my very hardest to let them, like I, that is their hard-earned money. 
they're away from their family making money and they're mm-hmm. choosing with millions of nonprofits to give to they're, yeah, I don't care if it's $5 or if it's $500 a month, they're mm-hmm. choosing to give to my nonprofit because they believe in the demographic I serve and that that's an important cause. Mm-hmm. And if you're in the mode of giving, that's when I want you to give to my nonprofit is mm. you and I tell people that you need to feel led. There's so many good nonprofits out there. Um, I support other nonprofits, you know, yeah. financially. So there's some very good nonprofits out there. You really need to feel led to that. This one's important. And, yeah. and we believe in the work that she's doing. Yeah. And, you know, our tagline is redeeming generations. You know, it's, that's, the, we really believe that our work is, it's not just about now it's for forever. Mm. So um, really, really um, diving into that and um, believing in what you're doing and, and letting the people and having the people that are going to come alongside you to volunteer or serve. And so for volunteering, you know, people can just, um, there's many ways to walk alongside. Obviously being a monthly supporter is the best thing for us because it helps us keep the work that we're doing. Um, and we're very protective that ours is specific to the demographic we serve, especially the kids in the foster care system and the teen moms. It's um, we are protective of them. So we don't, we have kind of a, a system that we walk through. If you want to come alongside, it's a commitment. Um, a lot of people will say, Oh, I want to help. I have a heart or I was a teen mom and I have a heart for this. And I always, that conversation always starts with that's great. So here's what we do. We meet every Tuesday night. We have a discipleship program. We feed them dinners. We give them diapers and wipes. I always say, but it's a commitment. So I want you to pray about that because once you commit to this, you know, these, this demographic of, of girls of, from foster to teen moms have had been abandoned mm. most of their life. And everybody yeah. that's told them they're there, they end up not so that's always an interesting fact of, mm. um, so for my nonprofit, we say out of the respect for who we serve, we ask if you want to serve alongside us, really take some time praying about that because, um, it's a commitment. And I think we live in a world that's very non-committal. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody breaks their commitment. Nobody's word mm-hmm. is their bond. So, um, that's something that is not, we really stand firm on that of let's mm-hmm. make this a commitment. I I think that's so beautiful. And I I love your slogan, redeeming generations, because truly it's breaking the cycle of whatever is broken. And so that is so beautiful. And also being very thoughtful about who you are serving Mm -hmm. and who you're allowing to help serve you. You know, sometimes people get very excited because they're like, oh, we just want money. And then you forget that where this money's coming from and then how demanding mm-hmm. are the people that are giving you that money or not demanding or mm-hmm. how involved or not involved. And is, is their thought process or their purpose uh, or their intention aligned with your mission? And I think that's so important to think about. And so you have given us such great advice this entire you know time talking to you. More than that, just so much wisdom. Wisdom in just being like, being purposeful and, you know, just kind of going back to your book also purposefully woven. I'm going to have all the links in the show notes as well. And so that way people can access you. Are you on Instagram? Are you on something like that where they could follow you and connect with you? Yeah. Yeah. So my personal Instagram is called Kelly writes K E L E and then writes with a W because I write. Mm. Um, so Kelly writes and then, um, my ministry is Do Good Ministries, and on Facebook, it's Do Good Ministry. And um, yeah, it's kind of like a green logo with like white lettering, and and I post, you know, most of the updates on there. And if they want to go on my website, it's DoGoodMinistries.org, and I'm sure you'll have those links. I'll have um, everything in there. Yeah. So um, everything pretty much has the same name, and um, I love for people to reach out. I mean, I I am one of those. I'm very hands-on. I'm one of those. Um, I'm not a nonprofit that I mean, literally I'll, I'll give you my phone number. You can call me we can talk. I'm very organic and authentic into, I want to know. And, and going back to that, you know, when you want, it doesn't matter if you have 20, 30 people on your, on your giving and serving team. Um, or if you have 10, you know, you want quality and you want people that believe in what believe in what the work that's being done. So that's, that's, that's super important, but yeah, that's where they can find me. Awesome. Awesome. And so before we head out, I'm going to ask you quickly, what is another nonprofit that you love? Ooh, 
Ooh, I wasn't prepared for that one. Oh, I know, um, but I heard you say that you support others. I'm like, well, that's great. I want to know which one, which other I one you do. Would okay, yeah. okay. So, um, one that I financially support and that I've actually served with with my ministry is called Casa de Luz Ministries in Mexico, mm-hmm. and they serve the same demographic. So they serve. Um, uh, they actually rescue single moms. Same thing, mm-hmm. and they actually have started a. It's a, they work out of a church and so it's a a school for the kids. And so the moms can go to work. Mm. And so basically I sponsor a child so that she can, I can pay for her to go to school. So then her mom can go to work and and it's the same thing breaks that cycle. Mm -hmm. So of course I, you know, it's the same demographic of, of what, but we've, um, my team has gone to Mexico and served with them. And so, um, and then we were going to go back and the pandemic happened and I haven't been back since, but it's something actually just today, I was reading an email from uh, a story of one of the moms and the, and the kids, and it's just a beautiful, mm-hmm. um, well run, very well trusted. It's the other thing you need to make sure that you feel comfortable and you're trusting. There's a lot where we can give our money, but that doesn't always mean your money's being used how it says it's being used. So yeah. Be careful with that. So true. So true. Mm-hmm. Transparency is everything in a nonprofit. And, um, you know, I know you mentioned earlier some of the books that you really enjoyed reading for your business. Is there any other books that you'd like to add to that list? Uh, for business? Um, or self or not just, you know, fun, leisure. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I mean, well, first of all, I'm a writer, so I'm a huge reader. Oh, goodness. Well, my favorite book is Language of Flowers. Mm. And, um, it's, and, and I was, and the funny thing is, is I think I read this book and I don't have it cause I gave it away. Cause that's what I do. I give books that I love. I give them away to people. And so I, I'm like, I need to buy a copy again. Um, I probably read that. Like, I don't even know, maybe my thirties and it, and I was thinking, why do I love that book so much? It's just a, like a normal nonfiction. Well, surprise, surprise. I'm like, well, the whole story is a redemption. I'm all about redemption stories, like redeeming Jenner. And it's about a teen aging out of the foster care system and no she's way. pregnant and she's homeless <laughs> and how she gets this job, like, and people interweaving. And if you read my book, Purposely Woven, you'll understand the whole premise. But it's like, a, it's talk, talking about, I use the whole image of our life as a tapestry and how mm. God weaves things and then people in and out of our life. And so I'm like, the whole, it's a beautiful story. You need to read it. Mm. So it's called language of flowers. And, um, it's this just a fiction book that I did. I had a book club in California. That was a pretty big book club. And we had, we read, we were there, we met for like five years. It was fun. And that was one of the books we read and it was my favorite book. Yeah. It was my, I I still, to this day, it it just brought up some, it it was very, and I remember it was one of those points in life. I remember that book actually, I, in the back of it, I was like looking up online, like how to get involved with foster kids because I was working with teen moms, but I hadn't really gone into that. So there was that step of like God opening that door for me to already have a heart. I was just so like, I gotta, I, I gotta help these kids. So anyway, it's, I, it's interesting. I, but yeah, I, love I love that. that yeah, that I love how that's so true and how, you know, it's really important. And we're going to, I'm going to end it on this, that sometimes we look at incidents in our life typically the really bad ones. And we think, gosh, how could that have happened to us? But the reality mm-hmm. is that, you know, and like how you said, if you can move past that, and if you can allow yourself to heal, you also see how that incident or that challenge is actually helping you and promoting you to the next chapter in your life. It's helping you refine yourself even more and find yourself, find why you've been put into this planet, into this world. That's- if that's exactly what my purposely woven my first yeah. book is about. And it's I walking through that. I think everything happens for a reason. It's not a coincidence. So thank you so much for being here with us, for sharing for your story me. and your knowledge. I'm just so happy that you were here. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining Law Chat with Gerja. I love these kind of stories and conversations where we can be real, honest, and open and having fun at the same time. I hope you are inspired and motivated to keep doing the amazing work you are doing. If this is something that gave you all those feels and then some truly motivated and inspired for you, you can show your love in all or one of these ways. Be sure to give this video a thumbs up, subscribe and share this video with your community and tell them about it or share with somebody that can benefit from it. 
I look forward to seeing you next time on another episode of Law Chat. And until then, keep moving forward. Bye. Thank mm-hmm. you.